Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 297 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. The history of Native American land dispossession is as old as the story of colonization. European colonists and white settlers came to the Americas and the Caribbean wanting land for farms and settlement. So they found ways to acquire lands from indigenous peoples by the means of negotiation, squatting, bad faith, war, and violence. Now, one of the questions that you send to my inbox on a fairly regular basis is about the period of Indian removal during the 1830s. It's a topic that I've always thought was a bit late to cover on this podcast because we try to cover history up to about 1820. But you request this topic so often, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the history of Indian removal, even in the 1830s, is deeply rooted in the history of early America. So today, Claudio Sant, a scholar of Native American history at the University of Georgia and the author of the book Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory, joins us to discuss the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and how Native Americans in the southeastern part of the United States were removed from their homelands and resettled in areas of what is now southeastern Kansas and Oklahoma. Now, as we investigate Indian removal with Claudio, Claudio reveals the origins of the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and what the act meant for Native Americans living in the southeastern United States. Information about how the act passed Congress amid much opposition and details about the lands the United States traded dispossessed Native Americans and the migrations Native Americans made to their new homelands in present-day Kansas and Oklahoma. But first, have you signed up for the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter yet? It's a publication that comes out every time a new episode of the podcast publishes, plus perhaps maybe two or three times a year when the Omohundro Institute and I have something special to share with you. But most importantly, the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter will place the show notes for each new episode right in your inbox, which means you don't ever have to worry about visiting the show notes page or worrying that you might forget to click on a link to some of the books, historic sites, resources, or episode sponsors that we discussed in each episode. You'll have all those links and resources right there in your inbox. Now, signing up for the Ben Franklin's World newsletter is quick and easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. All right, are you ready to investigate Native American land dispossession and the Indian Removal Act of 1830? Please allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Joining us is the Richard B. Russell Professor of American History at the University of Georgia. He's the co-director of the Center for Virtual History and the associate director of the University of Georgia's Institute of Native American Studies. Our guest is a former Ben Franklin's World guest, and he's published numerous articles and books, including his most recent book, Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's World, Claudio Sant. Thanks. It's great to speak with you again, Liz. To start our conversation, we should know that in 1830, the United States Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. And this was an act that prompted a large forced migration and removal of many Native American peoples from their homelands east of the Mississippi River to new homelands west of the Mississippi River. Claudio Linda wonders if you could tell us about the origins of the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and why this act led to the dispossession of so many Native Americans. Well, I think the first thing to recognize is that although there had long been a desire on the part of some politicians and white Americans to deport Native peoples, it really did take a piece of federal legislation, a law, to get this done. The federal government had to have a formal role and had to be authorized to exchange lands 
with native peoples in the east for lands in the west. So then the question was how to get that legislation through Congress. And despite the fact that in 1830, the Congress was overwhelmingly Jacksonian, it wasn't at all clear that this legislation could get through Congress. It was extraordinarily controversial. It was, in fact, the most controversial piece of legislation to come before Congress up to that point in time, and it generated a mass petition campaign, the first ever, really. At the end of the day, the legislation passed in the House by a mere five votes, and that was only after Jackson had threatened and cajoled politicians, including several folks whom he focused on from the delegation in Pennsylvania who proved to be the key votes to get this legislation through. You mentioned that there was a need to exchange lands in the West for lands in the East. Why did the government need to exchange these lands? Why did they actually want Native American lands east of the Mississippi River? So I wouldn't say it's a need. I would say it's a desire. And the seat of that desire is really in the South, where I currently live. And really, it was Georgia, I think, that was at the forefront of this movement. Southern planters were interested in the lands that Native Americans lived upon. These were really some of the most valuable agricultural lands in the entire world at the time. And the Creeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws lived atop this fertile crescent of land that arcs through Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi that we call the Black Belt today. And so planters were eyeing these lands, and they had these visions of expanding westward, of creating this empire of plantations and enslaved people. And so Indian dispossession was really central to that vision. You know, there are some people who would look at Indian dispossession and say, well, it was inevitable. I mean, just look at the history of what happened in colonial America with imperialism and colonialism. But Claudio, a central argument of your book, Unworthy Republic, is that this mass expulsion of Native Americans during the 1830s was not inevitable. So would you tell us why the mass expulsion of Native Americans from these southern lands was not inevitable? This is something I really underscored in the book, as you point out. And I still receive pushback, including from professional historians, although we all know that nothing is inevitable in history. And if you visited Oaxaca City or Cusco in Peru, you know that there are places in the Americas that still have very large indigenous populations in their traditional homelands. So as I said at the outset, this really needed a piece of legislation, a law in order for this policy to be enacted, and it had to get through Congress. And as I mentioned, it passed by a mere five votes. So I think there were other alternatives, and certainly indigenous Americans recognized this. Surveying the landscape in 1830, they saw the pressure, the tremendous pressure they were under. They recognized the threats but they still held out the possibility that they could retain their traditional homelands, that they could work out some sort of compromise. And in fact, they almost did. Even after the legislation passes, John Ross, the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, negotiates for the next seven years in the hope that the Cherokees can retain their homelands in the South. And in fact, he is almost successful. It's really not until federal troops march in in 1838 that the game is over. That is really interesting. And I wonder if you would tell us about the Cherokee people and what it was like for them to live on homelands in Georgia, the Carolinas, and parts of other southern states as well, along with all sorts of white people who must have been encroaching on Cherokee lands. Yes. And it's important to say at the outset that we often conflate Indian removal with the story of the Cherokees, but they represented a relatively small fraction, really, of the 80,000 individuals who were removed during this period. There were about 15,000 Cherokees who were removed, but certainly they were at the heart of this story. John Ross was one of the most active indigenous politicians at the time. But there's this great diversity, not just among indigenous Americans, but within the Cherokee Nation. So there are people like John Ross, who speaks English 
fluently and, and indeed is raised speaking English and has a better command of the language than his antagonist, Andrew Jackson. And he dresses them with a waistcoat and tie and looks as distinguished as any white American politician at the time. But then there are also Cherokees who, who are living more traditionally, who are subsistence farmers and hunters who largely just want to be left alone and don't want any part of the American Republic or don't want to engage in the U.S. economy. So there is this tremendous diversity. But you could say the same thing, really, about U.S. citizens at the time. Your point about John Ross in particular does raise the point that the Cherokee are known for having made some efforts to make aspects of American culture their own. You know, they went to missionary schools like Ross did to learn English. They developed their own written constitution and government. Were there other Native peoples southeast of the Mississippi River who made efforts to try and govern themselves and appease Americans, you know, hold on to their homelands by adopting aspects of American culture and governance? Yes, absolutely. Slaveholding is perhaps the institution that we think of first when we think of Southern Indians adapting white practices. And slaveholding was was adopted not just by the Cherokees, but also by the Creeks, Choctaws, and Chickasaws. And of course, slaveholding didn't look exactly the same. There was this spectrum. On one end, you had people who practiced a kind of chattel slavery. And on the other end, you had individuals who practiced a more traditional kinship slavery. But the Cherokees also had a set of written laws. So yes, I mean, you could see this across the South, that Native peoples were adopting and negotiating and figuring out a way to exist in the shadow of the United States. And you could also see this in the Old Northwest as well. And these people sometimes intermarried with white and Black Americans. Some of them were fully engaged in the U.S. economy. So they really saw themselves and imagined that they could have this future living within the bounds of the United States. Now, what about treaties? Because it sounds like many Native American peoples made an effort to live within the United States as best they could. And if we look prior to 1830 and its Indian Removal Act, we will find that the United States government agreed to a lot of different treaties of peace and cohabitation with Native American peoples. So in essence, these treaties show that both the United States and Native peoples, you know, did as you just said, you know, expected that Native Americans would continue to live on their homelands side by side with white Americans. So Claudio, would you tell us about maybe one or two of these revealing treaties in the pre-1830 era and the ways in which these treaties suggest that there might have been a peaceful path forward when it came to Native Americans and white Americans living peacefully side by side within the United States? Right. The important point here is that there are numerous treaties which promise Native peoples title to their traditional homelands. And this is true for the Choctaws and the Creeks and the Cherokees and the Chickasaws. So you can just go nation by nation and you can see that in these previous treaties signed with the United States, they would agree to cede a portion of their land on condition that they could hold on to the remaining portion of their land. And so when the time came, when Andrew Jackson opened negotiations to deport these peoples, they were astonished that this plain language in their treaties, and they pointed to this language, that somehow the federal government was saying this language didn't say what it appeared to say. And they also, for that reason, were dubious that Jackson's promise that they could retain their homelands in the West, that is an Indian territory in present-day Oklahoma, that they could retain this new land for as long as the grass grows and the waters run, They were dubious about that because they had already signed treaties that said pretty much the same thing. 
And so some of them ask, you know, what promise is there? What contract is there that is stronger, that is greater, that is more meaningful than the treaties that we had already signed? And indeed, there was no good answer to that question. And in fact, as we know, their fears proved to be justified because in the 1890s, once again, the United States moved in and took their lands from them. How many treaties are we talking about here that the United States made with Native American peoples prior to 1830 and that the United States then in turn violated so that they could take Native American lands? So how many treaties did the Indian Removal Act of 1830 allow the United States to violate? Right. That's a great question. And I don't have a number on my fingertips here. These are treaties that in some cases were signed willingly. In some cases, they were intentionally mistranslated to indigenous Americans. Sometimes they were coerced or tricked in various ways to signing these treaties. But then in some cases, they signed the treaties, they had promises to be able to retain their homelands, and it didn't matter. So the United States acted in bad faith, and one of Andrew Jackson's fervently held beliefs was that a treaty with an indigenous nation was meaningless. How could it mean anything to sign a piece of paper with a group of savages, he said. I'm crudely paraphrasing, but that captures his sentiment, I believe. So what changed by 1830? Because it sounds like the United States government and many Native American peoples signed treaties with the hope and desire that they would be able to live peacefully amongst each other. And yet, by 1830, something must have changed because now a lot of Americans are thinking, no, we can't live peacefully with Native Americans. We need to dispossess them from their land and remove them west of the Mississippi River. So what is that change? Where did it come from? I think a lot of these treaties were signed in bad faith by federal officials. I think a lot of white Americans never believed that they would have to abide by the terms of these treaties. I think a lot of Native peoples probably recognized that they were taking extraordinary risks in signing these treaties, but also understood that they had no better course of action. And so there was this political moment in 1830 where Southern politicians had managed to gain enough support. And of course, they were undemocratically empowered by the three-fifths clause in the Constitution, and they used that extra power to get this legislation through Congress. But again, there's a lot of pushback. There are a lot of not just indigenous Americans, but white Americans, especially in the North, in fact, almost solely in the North, who understand that the United States, by breaking these promises, is undermining its foundational values. And they say this in the petitions to Congress. They hold out this hope that somehow the republic is going to be different. And you have to remember, they're only a generation or two away from the American Revolution. So they've heard these stories from their grandparents about the cause of the revolution. And when they think about their own position and what they're fighting for, or what their government is doing, they believe that it is a foundational threat to the republic and the values of the republic. The question before them is, is the United States going to be like the corrupt, despotic governments, nations in Europe, or is it going to be something different? And this is what they say in their petitions to Congress. And this brings us to another point that you raise in your book, The Unworthy Republic, which is that capitalism and American greed were also ultimately to blame for the passage and implementation of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So, Claudio, would you talk a bit more about which group of Americans pushed the hardest for the Indian Removal Act and what this group of Americans stood to gain by removing Native Americans from their ancestral homelands? Well, I think it's Southern planners at the forefront. But one of the things that I discovered and that surprised me the most was that financiers on Wall Street and Boston and Philadelphia were funneling millions of dollars down into the South to profit from this dispossession. In fact, there were European investors who were involved as well in London, William Wordsworth's daughter inherits 
bonds in Mississippi state bonds that were initially floated in order to capitalize one of the banks in Mississippi to convert indigenous lands into slave plantations. So we think of this, I think, largely as a Southern story, but in fact, the financing for dispossession is coming from the Northeast. So in the book, I follow the story of one particular financier, J.D. Beers, who was one of the leading capitalists on Wall Street. And he just has his hands in everything that's going on in the South. He's initially financing the production of cotton in the 1820s, but then he sees this opportunity and he understands that there's a potential once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunity to make millions of dollars at the expense of indigenous Americans. And so he and his peers on Wall Street create these joint stock companies and work as hard as they can to dispossess Native peoples. That's really interesting, you know, given the time period, because between 1830 and the 1860s, we do get this image of the United States as being separated into these two isolated regions, right? The North and the South. And yet, as we can see through this story of Indian removal, to carry out Indian removal, you actually need a lot of Northern and international capitalists to help you. So I think, you know, in this case, we can really see that these two monolithic antebellum regions of the North and the South, right, are actually very intertwined, which is not something we see in a lot of narratives about this period of United States history. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And of course, a a number of historians have been working on this story from various angles. So this is just one piece of the puzzle. But you know, the way you describe it is accurate. We do think of these two regions as separate, but Wall Street capital is flowing back and forth constantly. Now, one individual who's come up a few times in our conversation is Andrew Jackson. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I'd really like for us to explore and investigate Jackson's role in Indian removal. Intelligent Speech is back. Intelligent Speech is an online conference dedicated to connecting independent educational content creators with their listeners. This year's conference will take place on April 24 at 10 a.m. Eastern or 3 p.m. London time. And I, Liz Covart of the Ben Franklin's World podcast, will be speaking alongside with David Crowther of the History of England podcast and around 40 other great content creators. With 24 hours of content in four simultaneous streams, there will be a lot of great content to discover. Interact with your favorite show hosts and your fellow fans in this immersive conference experience. Tickets are $30, but they're available right now for a special early bird price of $20. You can get your tickets right now by visiting intelligentspeechconference.com slash shop. That's intelligentspeechconference.com slash shop. Claudio, what was Andrew Jackson's interest and role in Indian removal? Sure, he's the iconic villain in the story, but there's lots of blame to go around. The planters, Southern politicians, squatters on indigenous lands, the Wall Street bankers we talked about, investors in London as well. So, I mean, there's just a, there's a lot of blame to go around. Jackson is important because Southern politicians need a friend in the White House to get this legislation through. And so, you know, without him, they're not going to get the Indian Removal Act. He does see this as the centerpiece of his presidency. You know, Martin Van Buren says it. It's a Southern act, he says, but Jackson wanted this piece of legislation above all. He wanted this piece of legislation. It is his great legacy, really, to the United States. President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act into law on May 28, 1830. And Rosa and Mark wonder if you could tell us about the legislative process or, you know, the politicking that was involved to pass this act. So I would love to know more about this. And I dug through lots of records to try to find it. But, you know, I did find these anecdotes where the delegation from Pennsylvania was describing the tremendous pressure that was placed on them by Jackson and his cronies. Jackson said that he would end their political careers if they didn't line up behind him and line up behind this piece of legislation. And one of them said, well, this was as terrifying 
to some of them as if they were being threatened with the guillotine. So he berated their records. There's one description of him lying to one of the delegates from Pennsylvania, making a promise that he never kept. And I'm sure there's a lot more to the story that we just don't, you know, we don't have the records. But it is clear that there's heavy and constant and high pressure lobbying that Jackson is using from the outset. And as I said, just barely gets this legislation through. Of course, we do know this one thing, right? You know, that even though we don't know what Jackson threatened the Pennsylvania delegation with, we do know that he threatened the Pennsylvania congressman. Well, and the day of the vote, two of the key members of this delegation are missing. And so they have to go try to round them up. One of them they find within the hour, but the other one is missing. And it takes them some time to find this guy who who finally shows up on the floor of the house and is acting as if he's deathly ill. It turns out that was just an act, a sham. He just did not want to be there to have to cast the vote. And then the people who cast this vote, and you have to remember Pennsylvania is, there are lots of Quaker voters and they have lined up strongly on the opposite side. They are among the most fervent opponents of this legislation. So these politicians are caught between Jackson on one side and their Quaker constituents on the other side. But the few people, members in the House who switched their votes are just excoriated in the Pennsylvania newspapers for the next year or two. Now, what about pressure from the other side? You mentioned at the outset of our conversation that the Indian Removal Act passed Congress by just five votes. So was there equal pressure to press people to vote against this act as much as there was pressure to vote for it? There is. And first and foremost, and obviously it comes from indigenous intellectuals and politicians. And some of these people are extraordinarily savvy. They are well read. And again, John Ross is the most notable example. But they understand that if they're going to be able to defeat this legislation, it's going to be by forming alliances with reformers and Christian reformers who were coming out of the North. And so Elias Boudinot and John Ridge and others go on speaking tours up and down the East Coast trying to rally opposition to this piece of legislation. It generates the first women's petition campaign in opposition to the Removal Act. So I know, again, they they understand how politics work by the 1830s, and they know how to play the game. And as I say, they almost won in this instance. Do you know anything about how the vote broke down? Because it does seem like we're talking about a lot of different parties and interests at play here. You know, we have white Southern planters who want to dispossess Native Americans from their homelands, white financiers who want to make a profit from Indian removal. And then, of course, As you were just saying, there were the Quakers, Native Americans, and other reformers who thought that dispossession would taint the United States and its republic. So do we know how the vote really broke down between these different interest groups? Yes. And, you know, and obviously I'm not a political historian, but the one thing that's just obvious, and I have a map of this in my book, is that this is a North-South vote, really. There are enough Northerners who side with the South to get the legislation through. Some of those delegates come from Pennsylvania, as we've been discussing. Many others come from New York. And this is largely, I believe, because of the influence and power of Martin Van Buren in his home state. Now, as we've stated, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 passed by five votes. Claudio, How did Native Americans respond when they learned that the Indian Removal Act had passed Congress by this narrow margin and then was signed into law by President Andrew Jackson? So some nations sign treaties and decide they're just going to cut their losses and get out of town. Others do so only after some very serious threats and some bribes to sign treaties to move. But others hold out as long as they can. The Creeks do that. The Seminoles do that as well. And and of course, most famously, the Cherokees 
as well. So it's not necessarily game over for these folks. They still see that perhaps they can hold out. And it's important to recognize that the legislation itself, all it does is to authorize the president to open negotiations. So there is nothing in there that coerces Native peoples. And there's nothing that gives the president the authority to go to war or force Native Americans to sign treaties. But what the South does, and Jackson supports them, what the South does is to pass, extend state laws over Native nations. They come up with this plan in 1827, and then Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi, each in succession, passes a series of laws. And so that gives them this kind of coercive power, this oppressive power over these peoples. And so they can make their lives so unbearable and so miserable that they have no option but to sign the treaties. So there's a Choctaw leader who says, yeah, you know, we were supposedly doing this willingly, but it's as if we're facing a giant forest fire and we're at the edge of a lake. So, you know, we can We have to jump in the lake and try to swim a mile to safety on the other side. But, you know, who would say that we're doing this willingly? We are being coerced and pressured and forced to do it. This raises a really intriguing question for us. So in episode 286, we spoke with historians Kathleen Duvall and Julie Reed, and they told us all about Native American sovereignty and how Native American peoples lived within sovereign Native nations, even if those nations were within the physical boundaries claimed by states like Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. So when you're talking about these state laws that had coercive powers, how do they work on the ground? Because technically, these Native nations should have been outside the purview of states like Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama. This is exactly what indigenous politicians say. You know, how is it possible that Alabama, for example, somehow has the authority and power to pass laws over the Creek Nation? And Creek politicians say, you know, Alabama just became a state a few years ago, and we signed all these treaties with the United States. At the time we signed these treaties in which you promised us that you would recognize, respect our authority, and honor our title to our lands, Alabama did not even exist as an entity. And now, they say, now you're claiming that there's nothing that you, the federal government, can do when Alabama passes these laws. So it's clearly a violation of the spirit and the letter of these treaties. But on the ground, it, you know, it doesn't really matter in the sense that Alabama can encourage squatters to move on to creek or Choctaw or Chickasaw lands. They can authorize local sheriffs to move in if a Creek woman opposes or tries to force off a squatter. They can just send in the sheriff to arrest her or just run her off her lands at gunpoint. And because Indigenous Americans are not permitted to testify against white people in state court, And this is true in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, with some variation and exception that changes over time as well. But for the most part, they're not able to testify against white folks. Then it just encourages squatters to treat these people as they want and the way they treat enslaved people as well. So Native peoples have very little recourse at this point, and that's the coercive nature of this. And Jackson and his Secretary of War, John Eaton, and then later Lewis Cass, they revel in this, that they can say that Native peoples are signing these treaties of their own free will. And they say this over and over again. They are doing this willingly. So it sounds like the coercive power in these laws is that the states have the ability to muster manpower and to incite violence against Native Americans, where Native Americans have no recourse in the courts for them. And so Native Americans are forced to sign these treaties in order to find some semblance of peace. Yeah, they encourage the violence. And Native Americans are not fools. They understand what they're up against, that if they take up arms, it's not likely to end well for them. Of course, The Creeks are pushed to the point where hundreds, 
of them are literally starving to death, peeling bark off trees in order to feed themselves, begging in the streets of Columbus, Georgia, just to keep themselves alive. They take up arms in the summer of 1836, and that sparks this very brief but violent clash between U.S. troops and the Creek Nation. But a lot of older Creeks understand, they remember the Red Stick War in 1813 and 1814. They know the terrible results of that conflict. And so they know that this is not a winning hand for them to play. You mentioned earlier that what the Indian Removal Act of 1830 really does is that it gave President Andrew Jackson and the national government the ability to negotiate a trade of lands. So would you tell us about the Western lands that the federal government has decided that it would like to trade Native Americans in the Southeast for their Southeastern lands? And also, you know, when this negotiation takes place, what kinds of leverage does each party have in this negotiation? So the lands are mostly present-day Oklahoma and also parts of Kansas, what they called Indian Territory at the time. These are lands that are uncharted in a literal sense. That is, there really are no maps. I mean, the couple maps that exist don't have any detail on them. And the little detail that does exist is actually wrong. So rivers are going in the wrong direction. They don't really know what these lands are. They don't know how they're going to get people to these lands because there are no roads that go there either. There's the possibility of moving people by steamboat, but a lot of these rivers are too low at certain times of the year. So that turns out to be infeasible. But when federal officials are meeting with Native Americans, they promise them, and they're over-the-top promises that these are extraordinarily fertile lands, that you're going to live happily ever after there, your soil is fertile, and there's running water, and it's forested, and there are game animals for generation upon generation. Native Americans insist on visiting, and when they do visit, the reports that they send back are not encouraging at all. And then the early settlers or colonists, if that's what you want to call them, the Native peoples who head west the earliest of the reports that they send back are also not encouraging. So that also leads Native Americans to decide to try to take their chance in the east if it's at all possible for them to do so. What did it really mean for the federal government to give eastern Native American peoples these lands in the west, you know, in Oklahoma and southeastern Kansas, when Undoubtedly, these lands were claimed by other Native American peoples. I mean, did this trade in lands, you know, for lack of a better term, lead to conflict between Western Native Americans, where these are their ancestral lands, and Native peoples who were just migrating from the East to live on these lands? That's a great point. I mean, they're not empty lands, and Native Americans in the East, in fact, are somewhat fearful of the Native peoples whom they're going to encounter. And And they use some of the language that white Americans use to talk about Western people, so that they describing them as savage and barbaric. They were fearful that they were going to be scalped by the Osages. So yes, there are certainly conflicts that arise, and the United States tries to preempt or prevent some of these by heading out West and signing treaties with the Osages and others to try to make room for the Choctaws and Chickasaws. But inevitably, there are conflicts that arise. You know, I mentioned earlier that the lands are uncharted, but it's not just that the United States doesn't have a grasp of the kinds of resources that are available. It also just has a difficulty trying to figure out what the boundaries are going to be between the Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Ottawa nations. Where exactly are these people going to be living and where do we draw the line or When we drew the line, where exactly was it, they wondered. Did the United States ever end up drawing these lines, or did they leave it to Native Americans to negotiate between themselves? Oh, no, they drew lines, and you can see these maps in the National Archives today. You can see the hard work and often futile work of clerks trying to figure this out. And some of the maps look like the kind of iconic National Geographic 
you know, each nation has a different color. So they start coloring them in and figuring out where people are going to live. But it's hard for us to imagine, I think, from our position today in the 21st century in the era of online maps and Google Maps and GPS, and we know exactly where we are and exactly where the rivers lie. And they are struggling mightily in the early 19th century trying to figure out where things are. So there are treaties. There's a great example, a wonderful example of a Cherokee treaty that was signed in 1828 with some of the early settlers that refers to a river that simply didn't exist. And the Secretary of the War was rifling through the map collection, couldn't find the river, then sent out a surveyor to head out west on the ground to identify the river, and just couldn't do it because the river just wasn't there. And that was a river that was supposed to mark a boundary for this particular land grant. Now, how did the process of removal work on the ground? So the first expulsion to take place after the passage of the Indian Removal Act was the removal of the Choctaw people. So, Claudio, could you tell us a bit about the Choctaw and about their migration from their eastern homelands to their new homelands in the West? So this is an enormous logistical challenge for the United States. And even today, trying to move 80,000 people with all of the resources and technologies and power and wealth that the United States has, when you're undertaking an operation where you're moving families, you know, nominally humanitarian operation, that is not moving troops, but moving families, the elderly, the sick, infants, pregnant women with all of their baggage who are moving unwillingly, that is an extraordinarily difficult task. And so for the early republic, it's foolishly ambitious to try to do this. The federal government has 11,000 employees and most of them work for the post office at the time. So how are they going to do this? They don't have instant communication. They don't have maps. They need to feed these people. They need to arrange for transportation. The food needs to be placed in depots along the way. It needs to be there at the right time in the right place. And none of this happens. And as you mentioned, the Choctaws are the kind of test case in 1831 and 1832, and it's just a fiasco. It's poorly organized. The food isn't there where it's supposed to be. Some Choctaws decide to just head off on their own and take their chances, and they end up stranded in the middle of a swamp just to the west side of the Mississippi River in the middle of the winter. They have to be rescued. And the reports are that there were dozens and dozens of their horses that were frozen stiff upright in the muck of this swamp. And it doesn't get any better after the first year. In the second year, in 1832 and 1833, they're dealing with the continent's first cholera epidemic. And cholera spreads rapidly and rampantly on steamboats where there's poor sanitation. So it's just a, you know, year after year, it's a disaster. And then they start to outsource some of the logistics. But the incentive for these private contractors is to win the contract a bit as low as possible and then to make the profit by supplying Native peoples with rotten meat or grain, which is half of the amount it's supposed to be. I'm trying to form a picture of this migration in my head as you describe it. And it seems like we need to picture a lot of movement on foot, some river travel. There might have been some food, but not a lot of food on this journey to Oklahoma or Kansas. And that pretty much everyone on this journey will be exposed to diseases like cholera. Could you tell us even more about this migration experience? Like, how long did it take the Choctaw and other Native peoples who were forced to migrate? How long did it take them to move from the southeast to what are now Oklahoma and Kansas? And what was weather like on their journey? So for some people, it could be a relatively easy journey. If you got lucky and if you were on a steamboat that didn't hit any snags and it was able to feed the boiler constantly and wasn't hit with cholera, you might get lucky and you might get there in three weeks, depending on you know where you're leaving from in the east. Some folks had to walk for weeks, six weeks or eight weeks overland 
hundreds of miles to get there. Some people were stranded. I'm thinking of one group that was stranded in the middle of Indiana over winter there because it was too icy and too cold and they simply couldn't move. So for some people, it took half a year or eight months to reach their final destination. But it varied tremendously. And if you were one of the unlucky ones, you would end up on a steamboat. And I'm thinking of one in particular, the Thomas Yateman leaves the Cherokee Nation in the spring of 1834. So this is before the bulk of Cherokees are deported. It heads down the Tennessee River, gets into the Ohio, and then heads down the Mississippi. And you can read through the journal that was left by the federal officer who was in charge of this particular part of the operation. And one day, one child would die, the next day, another child. And then the number of deaths continues to mount. And then finally, there's this full-blown cholera epidemic, which strikes the ship. The end result of this is that of 500 people who set out on this ship, 45 of the children under the age of 10 died. So entire families were wiped out. Sometimes there was a single survivor. I'm thinking of one man who watched his four children die and his wife. You know, that's what would happen to you if you were one of the unlucky ones in this deportation. What was life like for these migrants once they arrived in Oklahoma or Kansas? Like, what was it like for these Eastern Native Americans to now live on new Western areas that were supposed to be their new homelands? One of the things they're giving up is this multi-generational knowledge that they had inherited of the land and its resources in the East. So where do you fish? When do you fish? When do you plant? What are the best soils? Where do you go to hunt? This is the kind of environmental knowledge which has accumulated over many generations. What plants do you harvest when you're sick? And then you are sent hundreds of miles to the West to a different region, different landscape, different flora and fauna, and you have to make a living. You have to survive. And obviously, this is before the age of Home Depot and Kroger. So you need to grow your own food and you need to build your own housing. And when you get sick, there's no pharmacy. You need to harvest the right plants. A lot of the plants didn't exist. A lot of the plants that they had relied upon in the East did not exist in Indian territory. So it's a tremendous amount of stress which is placed on these communities. And you can see the effects in the mortality statistics because it's not just that families are dying during the actual deportation. In those 20, 30 years leading up to the Civil War, the population in many instances stagnates or even shrinks. So they are facing these overwhelming challenges once they arrive in Indian territory. It does sound like the loss of this generational knowledge because these Native American peoples had to pick up and move west meant that a lot of these indigenous peoples really had to remake themselves and their customs from the ground up. Like it gives a whole new meaning to having to start over. They didn't have to remake themselves. And one of the astonishing things about this is if you visit Oklahoma today, Indigenous Americans have remade themselves, and they do now have a deep attachment. The folks who live in Oklahoma have a deep attachment to that land and consider it their homeland. But that process of remaking was difficult, and the consequences really resonated for generations. Claudio, you titled your book The Unworthy Republic, and I wonder if you would now tell us about the title of your book. And why the history and lessons of Native American land dispossession are really important if we want to understand both the early American past and the American present. So that is drawn from a letter that a young Choctaw wrote, a student at Miami University in Ohio, wrote back to a relative in the Choctaw Nation and said in so many words that the United States was an unworthy republic. And I think that was the 
question that white Americans face and recognized that they faced in the 1830s, what kind of republic would this be? And Native Americans recognized as well that this was a potential turning point. Was the United States going to live up to its rhetoric and the rhetoric of its founding generation, or would it be like the other despotic and imperial nations of Europe? So I think it's essential to understand this. I mean, for so many reasons, most broadly, because in a democracy, I think it's hard work to be a good citizen. And one of the things we need to do is to educate ourselves and understand why the country looks the way it does today. And so when we confront these political decisions today, we need to be informed about this longer history, I believe, in order to make a wise decision. But when we look at this period in the 1830s, I think it's also essential to recognize just how extraordinarily important this was to the course of the Republic, because the antebellum South and the the image of the sprawling slave plantations and cotton fields, the, the South that formed the Confederacy in 1861, that is the South that's really created by Indian removal. The heart of the Confederacy was Indian country only 30 years before the outbreak of the Civil War. So it is this operation, this extraordinary unjust political act that created that kind of iconic plantation South that we're all so familiar with. I also think just finally, I think it's worth noting that the United States undertook one of the first state-sponsored mass deportations in the modern era. And this is a unfortunate tradition with a lengthy history, and it includes the better known deportations committed by Turkey against the Armenians and the deportation of Jews and other people during World War II and on into the 1990s in Bosnia and Serbia. So the United States, I believe, is part of that longer history of state-sponsored mass deportations. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. Claudio, in your opinion, what might have happened if Congress had not passed the Indian Removal Act of 1830? How might the physical and social landscape of the eastern United States have looked differently today? And what would the world of Native America look like today if thousands of Native ancestors had not been forced to migrate west? So I think there are two parts to this answer. The first part is to recognize that the way U.S. citizens imagined their nation would have been different. So post-removal, as far as white Americans are concerned, Native peoples exist on the outermost advancing edge of their nation. They are outside, and Congress says this, they are now on an outside of us. Congress says. And in fact, Congress even appropriates funds to build a wall stretching from the Canadian border down to the Gulf to separate the United States from these people it had deported and from other indigenous Americans in the West. Now, this is obviously a foolish enterprise and only portions of it get built and then the United States continues to push West. But if Native Americans had been able to retain their homelands in the East, it would have changed the way U.S. citizens imagined and envisioned their nation. Native peoples would have remained on the inside, and that would have created a different kind of politics. So that's one side of it. I mean, the flip side of it is that Native politicians would have been able to practice a different kind of politics. I think one of the things we've done in kind of 
fatalistically thinking that this was inevitable is to underestimate the savviness and creativity of indigenous politicians. What kinds of relationships would they have been able to construct with the federal government and with the states had they been able to remain within the borders of the United States? I mean, that's a big question, but I don't think we can underestimate the creativity that they would have brought to bear on the situation. Are you researching and writing something new? I'm finishing right now a long time digital project, which is to create a time-lapse interactive map of the population north of the Rio Grande from 1500 to 1800. So this will plot Native peoples, African peoples, and European peoples decade by decade. It will allow people to zoom in and zoom out, to draw polygons on the map, to return a population count, and to see how that population count changed over time. So I started this many years ago. I have an NEH grant to finish it, and hopefully we can have a launch of this website in the spring of 2021. And if we'd like to reach out and ask you a bit more about your work or to find your digital mapping project, where should we go? Well, I'm easily available by email, just at csont at uga.edu. But for these digital projects, and I have others which are already up and in operation, you can go to ehistory.org and you can find links to these various projects. The population project, as I said, has not yet been launched, but hopefully if you show up on this site in this early spring of 2021, I hope you will be able to find it then. Claudia Sant. Thank you so much for taking us through the history of Indian removal and of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. I enjoyed it. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. The history of Native American land dispossession is much older than the history of the United States. It's a history that dates back to the first European colonists who settled in the Americas and the Caribbean. By the time the Indian Removal Act of 1830 had passed, Americans and indigenous peoples had more than 200 years of experience with dispossession. Each time Americans wanted new lands, they found ways to acquire them from Native Americans. Sometimes this involved negotiations in good faith. More often, it involved negotiations in bad faith, which we can see in the instance of Native American removal during the 1830s. As Claudio mentioned, the United States used the Indian Removal Act of 1830 to trade lands in territorial sections of the United States that had not been properly surveyed or mapped. United States officials promised fertile soils and access to natural water sources that often didn't exist when dispossessed Native Americans arrived in southeastern Kansas or Oklahoma. It seems from our conversation with Claudio that in many ways, the United States negotiated these land trades in bad faith. And it knew it was negotiating in bad faith when it offered new Western lands for the proven fertile southeastern homelands Native American peoples had occupied for millennia. And these bad faith negotiations were further supplemented by the coercive acts of individual states. As Claudio noted, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 simply allowed President Andrew Jackson and his officers to open negotiations and trade land. It didn't offer Jackson and his officers any coercive powers to force Native Americans to negotiate or relinquish their lands. So states like Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi decided to add coercive measures by making it easy to muster squatters to settle on Native lands and to make it impossible for Native Americans to challenge local sheriffs or to seek legal remedies for these abuses of power. Now, we need to highlight here that there is a great diversity of ideas, opinions, and beliefs among different Native American nations. While some Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, and other peoples negotiated with the United States and migrated west during the 1830s and 1840s, many others stayed behind to try and hold on to their lands, which is why they are still a large presence in the Southeast. We also need to highlight the fact that Native Americans have proven their resilience and ingenuity time and time again. They have remade and adapted their cultures, politics, and societies to the circumstances of their times and environments. And they have continually persisted in existing and carrying on their rich cultures. So while the period of Indian removal in the 1830s had profound and devastating effects on many Native American nations, including a great loss of life and culture. Indian removal also allowed for periods of Native American resistance, persistence, and renewal. You'll find more information about Claudio, his book, Unworthy Republic, 
plus notes and links for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 297. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your friends and family. For example, you could forward them your Ben Franklin's World email newsletter that came in your inbox for this episode. Now, if you don't have the Ben Franklin's World email newsletter, it's never too late to sign up. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash newsletter. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder, compose our custom theme music. Finally, what more about the history of Native American land dispossession would you like to know about? Your feedback always helps shape the show and the episodes we offer, so please send your answers to liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.